Now, uh, as I mentioned in that uh, message I sent out yesterday, uh, what I want to do is it's twofold, really. I, I want to uh, introduce you to this week's lab because it does need uh, an introduction. And also, uh, this week's lab, when you've completed it, is the starting point for the second assignment. So, uh, as you also know, I am trying to align what I do, which is as much as possible anyway, with what is happening in the Web App Dev 2 module. Now, I think I'm, I'm just slightly ahead of uh, Roseanne in terms of what she's doing, although I just had a quick look at her website for the Web App Dev 2 module. And the lab that she's working on, which she this week, now, I only glanced at it there briefly uh, a few moments ago. But I think once you've completed this week's lab, what you will have essentially is what you see on my screen now. And what we want to do then is we want to take that version of the web API, the let's call it the movies web API, and subjected to a CI/CD pipeline, which will include a deployment of the API, in our case, to the Heroku uh, platform. Now, I mentioned Heroku to you last week. If I just go over to my browser. Uh, if you haven't done so already, you need to create a Heroku account for yourself. You should also register for, or should have registered for the GitHub developer pack, uh, which will cover some of the costs. In fact, all of the costs really, uh, or the vast, vast majority of any costs that you might incur when using the Heroku platform. Also, as I'm uh, in my browser, you will also need to, if you haven't done so already, you'll need to create a an account on the MongoDB Atlas uh, service. I know this was mentioned in, I think it was probably last week's uh, lab in the Web App Dev 2 module. Uh, so you will need to create an account there and create what the, what's called a cluster and ultimately a database because we are going to be using this database uh, in this week's lab for me. And of course, we'll be using GitLab. Uh, just one second now. So as I said, uh, this is essentially what she will have uh, at the end of this week's lab in the Web App Dev 2 module. And so I'll just pretty quickly, if I just step through some of it, um, we have an index.js at the top level. That's where we create our Express app, as you know. Uh, am I looking at the right? Sorry, now just one sec. Yeah, um, that's where you create your Express app uh, here. And you add some endpoints to that um, API. So we're creating, we're adding the slash API slash movies endpoint. We're also adding the slash API slash uh, genres, which I'm not actually that interested in. Uh, this one I am interested in though, the slash API slash users. So it looks like there are three endpoints uh, attached to our Express app. There's also some authentication stuff going on, which I am ignoring. You can see here, I've actually commented it out. I've 
kind of left that complication out of this week's lab. Although uh, you can't leave it out of the assignment, but I'll talk a little bit about that maybe next week. And in terms of the actual API endpoints themselves, they're implemented inside here in the API folder. That's the way uh, Roseanne has structured it. And so here we've got three subfolders which mirror uh, the three endpoints that I mentioned there a moment ago. And so if we just go into the, let's say, the movies subfolder, that's where we have our uh, mongoose schema. Uh, which looks like this for a movie. So it's a fairly elaborate schema for a movie. There's some other stuff inside here as well, which Ro uh, Roseanne will cover. Uh, similarly, for users, um, uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, before I move on to users, in the index.js is where we have the implementation of the various endpoints uh, uh, components, if you like. So we looks like we're supporting a get request to the root of such API slash movies. So this is uh, this is the endpoint that would be triggered if the user wanted to get all the movies. We've got another get endpoint for slash API slash movies slash movie ID. Um, all of these are prefixed with slash API slash movies based on the Express app uh, that I showed you a moment ago. Uh, we've got another we've got another get for getting looks like getting the reviews for a movie. And finally, we can uh, we can host a review for a movie. I'm not obviously I'm not looking into the detail of these. Uh, that's for the other module. Uh, what else? Um, and it's a similar structure for let's say users. In the users, we have the user model file which contains the user schema uh, and some other convenience methods associated with. Uh, accessing uh, user records from the database. And then we've got the implementation of the user's endpoint. And this is where we support user registration and authentication. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you either are already familiar with this uh, or you certainly will be uh, by the end of this week from the other module. So that's inside the API folder. That's where all our API uh, is implemented. And then we've got some other uh, odds and ends, like we've got a DB folder, which is where uh, we implement making an initial connection with the database. And you can see actually that if when we go back, if we go back to the root index.js here, you can see at the top we're importing uh, we're importing that. So and the way we are importing it is is such that we it, it gets executed as part of the startup of our um, Express app, if you like. But anyway, what what happens inside in this index.js within DB is it makes a connection to our database. Uh, we've got a seed data folder, which uh, is only being introduced this week uh, in the web app dev side. And that's where we uh, store seeding data for our database and also a little bit of functionality, which performs the actual seeding. It actually writes to the database. Uh, if I just quickly go in there, so our let's say the movies.js file that has, oops, sorry now. Uh, where was I? Uh, 
Oh yes. Um, I mean that file. Oh yeah. Here's my. If I just expand this, you know, we've just got just some raw data. In this case, we've got raw movie data, which we can use to populate our database, uh, essentially during testing. Similarly, for in users, uh, in users, we've got some simple user data. It looks like we're just creating two, uh, two standard users. And in the index.js is where we actually perform the C. Uh, this, if we scroll down to the bottom of this file, uh, we check an environment variable. Uh, we check an environment variable here to see should we seed the database or not. And we're calling just three local functions. And here are our local functions. And within each of the functions, they are making the, they are making a request to to our database uh, to insert data. Uh, well, in, you know, it deletes what's currently in there, and then it does uh, it does an insert subsequently. Is that what's going on here? Sorry, no. um, do a delete, and then do a whole bunch of it and serves. So that's fine. That's really all happening uh, in your web app dev two module. Now, where where this module comes in, though, we're interested in things like testing and deployment. And so here's my here are my tests for my API, and my tests I I structured it um, sensibly enough. I I think. I've structured this along the same lines as the various endpoints that the API has. So I've got a users folder, which will oops, sorry, movies folder, which will contain all my movie table related testing, or move, sorry, movie endpoint related testing. And I've got a users folder, which will have all my user related endpoint testing. And if I drill down into, let's say, movies, and look at index.js. So here we've got our various test cases, uh, which he will uh, he can look at later on. Now, what I just want to draw your attention to though is I have a before block, and I've got an after uh, hook really before and after hook, uh, and I've also got a before each hook. And I've got an after each hook. Now we've seen the before each and after each hooks before, and we know what the uh, what you can put what you put into these before each and after each hooks is code that you want to have executed before each individual test case and after each individual test case. But uh, Maka also has, and I don't think we've used them so far. It also has a before hook and an after hook. And these two hooks get executed just once. The before hook, obviously enough, I think, is executed before all of the tests are run, or maybe rephrase that. It executes once before any test case is executed. And the after hook, uh, that's where you put code that you want to execute just after all of the tests have completed. So they're only executed once, whereas the, the each versions are executed multiple times, depending on how many test cases you have. And what am I doing in these hooks? Well, in the before hook, what I essentially I need to do is I need to connect to the database, just, just get a connection to my database. And that's what's going on here. And that's quite similar to code that you would have written over inside in the EB index.js actually. So I don't need to explain the code as such. In the after hook, what I'm doing is I'm essentially destroying the contents of the database because all this test will do is you know populate the database and I just want to clear it out when all my tests have completed. There's no need to just leave the data hanging around there, clean up half you, in other words. In the before each hook, uh, in the before each hook, what I want to do is uh, 
make sure that the initial state of my database is the exact same uh, before each test case executes. And so what I'm doing is, and this, this file now is specifically focused on the movies table. I essentially clean out the movies table, delete everything in the movies table, and insert my uh, seed data, essentially. Okay, so what this doing is, is uh, what this line that I've highlighted is doing is, it's inserting all of the movies that I've stored in my seeding folder, which is this folder over here. And I've already, we've already just glanced at the array of movies inside in this folder, which is inside in this file here. And if I scroll up to the top, you can see that I'm actually importing, I'm importing the movies from my seeding folder. Okay, so that's sort of classic uh, test logic in the sense that you want each test case to run in isolation and independent of every other test case. That's what the before each and after each hooks uh, are meant for. And so that's, uh, I'm achieving that. So, because before each individual test case executes associated with my movies endpoint, I clean out the movies table and I put a fresh uh, set of data into it each time. In the after each hook, uh, really all I'm doing there is it's more linked to the express app than it is concerned with the MongoDB database. I essentially need to shut down the current executing version of my API uh, and it gets restarted before each test case. Uh, I think we've seen that actually, we've seen that before in the, when we went to the um, web API testing lab. And then I have individual test cases, which I don't need to, you can look at those yourselves. Uh, so that's in the movies endpoint test. And it's uh, it's almost identical in the users. If I go into the users endpoint test code, it has this very similar structure, right? It has a before hook where I just try and connect to my database and I get a connection. So this variable here, db, that's my connection to my uh, MongoDB database. In the after hook, I eat out the users table uh, because here we're looking at the users endpoint test cases. And I've got a before each and an after each, which is similar to what I was talking about in relation to the movies endpoint. Uh, okay. Uh, well, it's slightly different. Uh, let me just go back to the movies for a second. And I look at the before each hook. Yeah, it's slightly different in the, so we're looking at the movies endpoint uh, code here now, the testing code. And in the before each, I am interacting with my MongoDB database, just putting some data, uh, cleaning out the data and then putting in uh, fresh data. So I'm talking directly to the database uh, in this case, whereas when I flip over to the users, uh, users API test code in the before each hook, I'm actually making, uh, let's see, let's see. Okay, I'm cleaning out the users table, but I'm not inserting data directly into the table. What I'm actually doing is I'm using the API itself to put data into the table for me. Uh, and the reason I'm doing it that way is because, as you will find out at the end of this week's lab in the Web API, 
when you the, the passwords, a user's password is not stored in raw text form in the database. It's actually salted and hashed before it's stored in the database. And so that's why I'm actually going through the API to add my test users rather than entering the test users uh, directly into the database myself. Uh, so that's a slight uh, nuance going on there, really. Right. Uh, so you can go back and look at this code yourselves once you've completed today's lab. So that's on the testing side. Not a whole lot there other than I am I am bringing in MongoDB. We've looked at API testing already, but we were using an in-memory data store, whereas now we're using a database and for sure, it uh, it slightly complicates things a little bit for us. So let's close off the testing side. The next thing is we want to deploy our API uh, in, onto some cloud service, and we're going to use Heroku. Now, you cannot deploy the uh, source code because the source code is uh, probably using aspects of modern JavaScript, which, uh, as I've mentioned before, the Node platform cannot execute uh, modern JavaScript. It needs to be converted to ES5 JavaScript. And that conversion process is what we refer to as building the API. So we talked when we talked about CI CD, we talked about the build stage in a CI CD pipeline. Now, what that means in relation to a web API is we need to compile all of our source code and create an ES5 version of each source code file. Uh, and so we need to automate that though. Uh, now, the, the conversion will be carried out by the Babel uh, tool for us. So uh, the, the result of building my web API or creating a build version or a production version of my web API, in my case anyway, the output will be put into a new folder called the build folder. And if I expand the build folder, what you'll notice is it has the exact same folder structure as our source code. So for example, if I go into build API and open up that, that has a genres, a movies and users subfolder. And if I expand on movies, it has various files. Uh, and that structure is the exact same as my source code, because if I expand API and movies, you can see the files here are in terms of names and folder structure is the exact same as in the uh, in the built version of my web API. Uh, and that's that's necessary. Otherwise, uh, the build version won't actually execute for you. Uh, because if we, you know, because there's still a lot of uh, module referencing going on within each of these files, but it is ES5 code. Like if I just click on this, for example, you, you know, it's 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 old, what I would refer to as old style JavaScript, but that's what we need to do. That's what we need to give to the node platform to execute. Now, we, we never need to look at that, uh, uh, that ES5 version. So how do we automate the uh, creation of this build folder? And the answer is uh, we do it in the by means of package.json scripts. So that brings us down to package.json. And there's quite a lot going on in package.json. Uh, in this case, you can see here just in the scripts section, there's, an, there's a quite a lot of scripts. Now, before I start looking at the scripts, uh, I just want to mention one or two third-party modules that we're availing of. Um, 
So if I say, let's talk about, there's this RIMRAF third party module. Um, so you don't know what operating system a, a user is going to be using when they're uh, building my web API. They could be working on a Linux operating system or a Mac OS or a Windows OS. But we would like our packets.json to be independent of whatever uh, operating system platform a developer is using when they're actually building uh, my API here. Now, in in some cases, the actual uh, terminal commands that you use on Windows are such a different from the commands that you use on Mac versus Linux. For example, on Windows, if you want to delete a file, I think the command is delete, whereas on Mac, it's RM for remove, and I think it's the same on Linux. So if I want to, uh, within some script, I want to delete a file, uh, and I want to have a script that does that, or delete a folder, then which command am I going to use? Am I going to use the Windows one, or the Mac one, or the Linux one? Uh, and really, you, you can't really. You've got to use something that works independently of the operating system platform. So the RIMRAF third-party tool, that is the that will allow us to uh, delete files from the uh, file system in a platform independent way. And you'll see me using that in a few moments. Uh, another example is if I want to do a file copy, the command on Windows is different from the command on Mac and Linux. I think it's, it's copy in the Windows case, it's CP in the Mac and Linux cases. The NCP, NCP is a, a small little utility, third party utility, which performs file copy in a operating system independent way. And okay, cross env is another interesting one. So the three ones that I'm highlighting now, RIMRAF, NCP, and cross env, they are three third-party libraries which implement uh, terminal commands in a platform-independent way. What cross env does is it allows you to set an environment variable from the command line, but do it in a operating system-independent way. Okay, let's, uh, and there's one or there's a couple of other ones as well, uh, which you haven't seen before, like this one here, npm run all. That's if you want to run a number of scripts. And uh, there may be one or two others that I've missed out on. Let's go back to the scripts though. So I want to be able to, from the command line, I want to be able to run, just give me one second now. I'd like to be able to run this command, npm run build. Pull that over. I'd like to, essentially I'd like to have a script called build in my package.json and what build, what I want the build script to do is to create that build folder structure that I showed you there a few moments ago. And so if I go into my package.json uh, and see how does that actually work? Well, here I've got a, here's my build script that I've written for myself. And the way you interpret this here is I want to run the clean script followed by the compile all script. Where's the clean script? Well, here it is right here. What does the clean script do? Uh, here I'm using RIMRAF. Uh, 
so what I want to do is I want to delete the build folder that currently exists uh, within my project, if if it's there, and RimRaf is intelligent enough to, if it if there is no build folder, then it'll just ignore it. So I want to delete the current build folder, and I want to make a new folder called the same name. Make there fortunately works on both Windows, Mac, and OS. So my clean script essentially gets rid of the previous build that I've done and creates a new empty build folder. Back to the build script. So uh, it runs the clean script and then it runs the compile all script. Now there's a lot going on here because you can see here, I've got a whole bunch of scripts that begin with compile and they're all compiling essentially each of the scripts that I've highlighted there, they're compiling a separate folder in my project. And if I just focus in on one of them, uh, let's say if we take this one here. Uh, so it's running the Babel command. Babel is the, uh, is the command that will take a set of JavaScript files and generate an ES5 version of those JavaScript files. And so I am saying, take all the files in this folder, slash API slash users, which is my users endpoint, slash API slash users is this folder here. All right now, let me just clean up a little bit. This folder here. Take all of those files and uh, compile them. In other words, generate an ES5 version of them and put them into this output folder. So it's creating a similar subfolder within my build to put all of the uh, source code users API uh, files. And all of the other compiles, or most of the other compiles, are doing the same thing. Now, it's unfortunate, but the way Babel works, uh, Babel is not clever enough to look at a folder and drill down into all of its sub sub folders. Uh, you can only, all you can tell Babel to do is you can give it a file or you can give it a folder and it will compile all of the files, the JavaScript files in that folder. It won't go looking at subfolders. So it's a, it's a bit of an annoyance really, but so that's why I've got so many uh, scripts here that are all concerned with compiling individual folders because essentially what I need to do is I need a script that compiles all of the files in the genres API folder. I need a sec another script that compiles all of the files in the movies API folder. Similarly for users, and I need to go into the authenticate, which is a new folder that you will add this week to your web API. Um, it doesn't have any subfolders, so I need to, there, there should be somewhere in here, there should be a script that compiles all of the source code in my authenticate folder. I need to do the same for, I just collapse this. I need to do the same for DB. I need to do the same for the seeding uh, subfolder. And finally, I need to do separate compile of the express app itself, which is this file here. So, uh, so we've got all of these compiles going on. And some of the compiles are referring to other compiles. So for example, if we look at this one here, uh, this is meant to compile all of the, uh, essentially the uh, database models within my source code. And I'm using the NPM run all, NPM run all, is a, 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 a utility that allows you to specify a number of other scripts. And I'm just referring to other scripts here, which are 
other compiled scripts that I have within this file. So there's a lot going on there, but it's um, it's all got to do with compiling my source code and putting the compiled version into my build folder. So I'm not going to step through all of these. You can just follow them yourselves. Now, as well as uh, in my build folder, as well as compiled versions of source code, there are also certain files that I just need to copy from the source into the build. For example, uh, all of the node modules uh, um, content, all of that needs to be copied into the build folder. Because if I look inside my build folder again, Uh, let's see now. You can see there's a node modules uh, inside there. And that node modules is a direct copy of the node modules from the source side. Now, you don't have to, obviously, uh, well, fortunately, more than obviously, you don't have to go compiling all of the various JavaScript files inside in these source node modules. They're, they are already in ES5 format, but we do need to copy them all. Similarly, the public, the content of the public folder that does not need to be compiled, but it does need to be copied over. And I'm doing that in one of the, uh, let's see, can I pick it out? Um, there, you can see that one there. Whoops. That one there is doing the copying. Now, I already mentioned that to copy a file from one folder to another, the command is different depending on whether you're working on Windows or Mac or Linux. Uh, and that's why I'm using this NCP utility, which is one of my dev dependencies that I mentioned a few moments ago there. I'm using that to do the file copy for me. So back to build. Build says, first run the clean script, get rid of the previous build, and then run the compile all script. And the compile all essentially, if uh, will execute all of the compiles and the copies uh, in my package.json. Right, uh, let's see. Start is okay. I've got some other convenience scripts as well. Like if I actually want to run the compiled version uh, of my web API, or put it another way, if I want to run the production version of my web API, if I just want to run it locally, uh, I've got a script, which is this script here, that will uh, uh, do that for me. And you can see what I'm actually doing. Well, what I'm doing here, first of all, is I'm setting some environment variables. Uh, some of these variables now, uh, you will have already come across in Yikes. Um, I'm setting some environment variables essentially on the command line. But the way you set environment variables on the command line is also different uh, for Mac versus Linux versus Windows. And that's why we're using our cross n futility to take care of setting environment variables. But eventually, what am I actually running here? I am running, uh, I'm running the node platform and I'm passing it my build index.js. In other words, I'm passing it the build version of my express app. And node can actually interpret the contents of that code. I cannot pass node my source index.js because uh, it will throw an error. Right. Um, you certainly will need to go back and just uh, review all of the scripts there to make sure you're happy with what's going on there. Next is, well, here's my environment uh, variables file. Uh, again, that comes really from the from the web API side of things. Uh, you do need to set, as you know, you need to set MongoDB 
to point to your database. Now I am pointing it by default to my database on the MongoDB Atlas server. Uh, so that's, uh, I've set it to a database that I've created for myself. You will be doing similarly uh, in the lab today. Just do also, uh, I think it's better to put quotes around the database string itself because the database string is quite long, as you can see. And there are some, there are some query string options that you need to set as well. So the only thing that uh, will differ between yours and mine is you'll have a different admin user, different password for that user, and a different cluster, uh, different cluster name. The rest of the query string part will be the same, but it is quite long, uh, and there are some slightly non-standard characters in it, which is why we're enclosing it in quotes. Uh, other than that, uh, that's all that's in the end file. In the GitLab CI is where we have our pipeline, and there is nothing new in this pipeline except for I have a stage which takes care of deploying my uh, deploying my API to Heroku, and that's this stage here. Now, I did show you a screenshot of this last week, but uh, this week we'll get to actually use it. And so to deploy a an Express app onto the Heroku platform, uh, you need to use a tool called the DPL tool. And we are installing this DPL tool here. You can install that locally on your own machine. Uh, you, you certainly don't need to. Um, but you can, but the unfortunate thing is in order to use that tool, you need to install the Ruby language uh, as well. And that can be complicated-ish anyway. So, but th there is absolutely no need to do it as far as I'm concerned. But I, I, when we're running this pipeline up on GitLab, we do need to install the Ruby language because it's not part of the image, the default image that we're using, which is just the, uh, where are we? Uh, just the latest, uh, where we're using a Linux image with the latest version of Node installed on it. But that image does not have the Ruby language. So we need to install the Ruby language and then install our uh, Heroku deploy tool. And this is the command to this is the command to deploy your essentially you're deploying your let me see now you're you're deploying the the way deployment works on Heroku and I mentioned this in this week's lab the way it works is uh, from the Heroku's point of view is Heroku maintains a git repository for each. Heroku application uh, that it manages on your on your behalf. You, you cannot access that Git repository. You cannot access it directly. What you do is, as a developer, is you essentially upload your source code. And that source code is stored in a Git repository up on the Heroku platform. And then the Heroku server itself uh, generates a build version of your source code, and it runs that build version. So the command that I've highlighted here uh, is the deployment command, but we don't deploy the build version of our application. We actually deploy or we upload the source version but the deploy tool will take care of that anyway. You don't have to tell it. Um, the, the tool automatically uh, uploads the source version of your application, and it takes care of putting it into a repository and running the uh, running your build script, essentially. 
Uh, when you register for Heroku, if you've already done it, uh, if you registered last week uh, on the Heroku platform, then Heroku generates an API key, or let's call it just a, a, a key specially for you. And you've got to provide that key when you're using this deploy utility. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, let's see. Uh, the actual deploy utility works with other services as well. So I, I do have to tell it which particular service am I using. And it's the Heroku service. Here I'm specifying my API key, but I, I'm not give, I'm not providing the key. Sorry, now which am I? No, sorry. This is the API key. But I'm not including my API key directly in my GitLab YAML file, because that would be unsafe. I'm actually, uh, I've already set up some environment variables up in, uh, I've set some environment variables up in GitLab. So there should be a, an environment variable in my GitLab project, which will have a name, uh, Heroku API key, and it will be set to the API key that you got when you registered with Heroku. And I also need to tell this deploy command which application up in Heroku, in my Heroku account, which application am I deploying to? So, and again, I'm specifying that as a, an environment variable. When you, uh, to use Heroku, what you need to do is, uh, once you've created an account, the first step is you need to create an application. And that application will be empty initially. Uh, but, and when you, in part of the creation process, involves giving a name to the application. And so it's that application name, that's what I'm uh, providing here as a command line argument to the DPL uh, utility. But of course, th this code runs, this code runs uh, up in GitLab and, you know, the pipeline is doing the deployment for me. That means I must have a GitLab project corresponding to this, and I do. And if I go over to my GitLab account, here's my GitLab account, and here's the actual project uh, for my web API. And if I look inside the settings part, Settings and I'm going to CI CD. And I've got a number of environment variables. And you can see this variable here and this variable here. They are the two variables that are being used in my, in this command here. I've also need to specify a value for the MongoDB environment variable because that's being used within my, uh, it's being used within my tests and it's being used within the actual Express app itself. Uh, the secret variable has got to do with uh, this week's lab that you're doing. Uh, it controls the hashing that goes on in, in your authentication implementation. CDB environment variable needs to be set because both the uh, sorry the the web API itself it checks to see whether CDB is true or false, and that controls whether it uh, seeds the actual database. So uh, we need to set those, declare those environment variables in my GitLab uh, for the purpose of my pipeline, for my pipeline to run successfully. And on the Heroku side, there are also environment variables and I explain how you set them. So I created a, an app up in Heroku. Here's my app. And that name, uh, 
uh, that name there, whatever it will be, that corresponds to back in GitLab, that corresponds to, sorry now, corresponds to this environment variable, sorry, this environment variable here. But anyway, you you uh, you see that going on in this week's lab. So it's back to Heroku in terms of environment variables for a particular application, because when my application, my API is running up in Heroku, it's going to be connecting to my MongoDB database. So we need to specify via an environment variable, what's the actual URL of my MongoDB database. And so if I go into this application, which I am at the moment, and if I go into the settings part, again, you'll be doing it in the, the lab later on. Here's where I declare environment variables for my Heroku app. And there I've got a MongoDB environment variable. I've got a port, which controls what port my, uh, my Express app is listening on. That relates, this relates to the authentication stuff. This relates to the seeding stuff. And okay, that's it. So uh, the various, essentially the various environment variables, if I go back to VS Code, the various environment variables that you have inside in your .env file, because uh, they're only useful when you're running things on your local machine. Uh, a lot of these, and in fact, maybe all of these environment variables need to be also set up in Heroku, because that's where you are going to be running your API in the in, in a production context. And indeed, uh, in the GitLab, the same environment variables need to be replicated across the various platforms. Right, uh, the final, final, final thing I'll mention is that you can see a file here called proc file that's required by Heroku. Because when Heroku doesn't really know what type you, of application your yours is, you know, you upload the source code, but you've got to tell it what type of application is it and how does Heroku actually run your application. And if you look inside the proc file, uh, there's only it's usually just a one line or maybe some other lines, but this is telling Heroku, well, it's a web application, and this is telling Heroku, how do you actually run it? And surprise, surprise, we tell it just to execute the node command and pass it a reference to build slash index.js. And that's how we run our production version of our of our uh, API. Right, um, an awful lot going on there. Uh, the highlights really are the various scripts inside in package.json. Need to make sure you understand those. Uh, the tests, of course, and the GitLab YAML file, and how to actually set the whole thing up uh, to ultimately get your API running up in the Heroku platform talking to your Mongo DB database, which is hosted over in the Atlas service. So there's a lot of moving parts uh, spread across essentially a distributed system. Right, uh, that's enough talk from me. Uh, I'll just pause for a minute in case there are any immediate questions or other questions related to other aspects of things that have been happening over the last few days. No. Okay, so if I go back to Moodle and here's the lab. So I'm going to hand it over to you and let you work your way through what you'll be doing is the, the assumption is you have already created an Heroku account, also that you've created um, a cluster for yourself up in 
MongoDB Atlas. They're the two prerequisites. And the first thing that you'll be downloading is in terms of code, essentially what you'll be downloading is what I have been working my way through or talking my way through there in VS Code. You're not cutting and pasting. You're hardly doing any cutting and pasting of code now today. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you the API. I'm giving you the GitLab YAML file. I'm giving you all of the package.json. It's all there. Uh, it's really the objective today is to get this thing up and running for yourselves. And you're not, there's no submission associated with this lab. But of course, the, the, the point is that it needs to be done as prep for the second assignment. Okay, uh, if there are no questions, I'll essentially shut down this Zoom meeting and I'll monitor Slack uh, over the remaining, where are we, over the remaining two hours of the lab. Okay, thanks.